Good, e good evening, everybody. It's been a long day, but I'll make it worth your while, I hope. I feel a certain sense of responsibility since mine is the very last graduate talk of the residency. So I hope to make a compelling case for the type of moving imagery that exists outside the studio system. The title of my talk is Witness the Change, Disrupting the Flow of, Mater of Cinema Through Materiality. I want to begin with this clip from one of my heroes, the legendary filmmaker, Mr. Craig Baldwin. The, uh, the idea of the director, in my mind, comes from theater and plays. And that's fine. I don't disavow it. In other words, I can't make it go away. But the, that particular mode dominates the cinema. So, uh, it's basically the, the theatrical film, or the fiction film. I am uh, interested in moving cinema beyond and where it's more like a thought process. And in the case of directing, which is telling other people where to move their bodies, it, it just seems so um, uh, uh, cliché. After I watched this clip for the first time, I realized that I hadn't even scratched the surface of what's possible to do with the moving image. Let's take a look at a couple of theories which anchor my understanding of flow. But before I do, I'd like to offer an analogy since flow is rather abstract. Rivers begin as drips of water that follow the cracks and folds of the landscape. When many of these drips flow down the same path, it becomes a stream. Eventually, this stream will converge with other streams. Finally, when enough streams have converged together, they form a river. What's important to note is the effect that the formation of rivers has on its surrounding landscape, as the water shapes the terrain, carving out valleys. With this in mind, let's examine the theories of Shannon and Weaver and Deleuze and Guattari. Shannon and Weaver use their backgrounds in engineering to create the Shannon Weaver mathematical model of communication, which details the path traveled by a piece of information from point A to point B. What makes their model so important is the way they manage to numerically represent different categories of information. And this model was used by scientific researchers for a number of years. A few decades later, French philosophers Guy Deleuze and Félix Guattari discussed flow in a broader, more philosophical context. In their book, A Thousand Plateaus, they say that flow can explain how social conventions become established over time. Since I graduated with a BA in psychology, their discussion of flow immediately reminded me of thought patterns, also known as schemas. Schemas are frameworks in our minds that allow us to think on our feet or react quickly in everyday situations. In my understanding, cognitive schemas and Deleuze and Guattari's theory of flow are both responsible for the formation of commonplace thoughts or ideas. Movies are fantastic at prompting us to feel a whole gamut of emotions, but why? That's difficult to pinpoint because of numerous factors behind the camera. To demonstrate this, let's analyze a shot from the greatest cinematic achievement of all time, RoboCop. <laughs> in this shot, the camera is placed low to the ground with RoboCop in the foreground. The harsh light and cast a shadow, which, is a silhouette, which also casts a silhouette of RoboCop. In his shadow, we see the criminals who are small in the frame and backed into a corner. All of these elements work together to communicate that RoboCop is an imposing figure who is in charge. Of course, one can find all of these elements in a photograph, but things grow more complicated when the images begin to move. The flow of cinema tells us which shot should follow this one, the placement of the film score, story arc, pacing of the edit, and so on. In a sense, all of these elements have flows of their own, which feed into a larger flow, just like streams converging together to form a, to form a river. Cinematic flow is rather complicated. 
and learning this complex framework was my primary objective during my first two semesters. At the beginning, I had no interest in narrative filmmaking. I once read an interview with Cameron Diaz in which she states, it's been said that in Hollywood, there are only 14 different scripts. While that quote resonated with me, I decided to dedicate myself to learning the language of cinema because I was determined to understand the breadth of my medium's capabilities. Working outside of those 14 scripts, I created Anna Land, a series of short films that takes place in a town inside my head, governed not by the hegemonic forces described by Gramsci or Foucault, but by my neuroses. This clip comes from the first installment of the series and is entitled, Wake Up Sheeple. The other day I was walking in the park to clear my head after work, you know. Then this huge metal thing falls out of the sky. So I walk over to it, and it's just this big mass of smoke and twisted metal. And that's when I realize it's a satellite. You know, from space. So I go to take a closer look at it. It's got like this huge vanilla folder in it. So I'm like, that's weird. And I open it. And it's chock full of surveillance pictures of me, man. Me walking to work, going to the store, leaving my house, everything. This freaking satellite's been following me around, taking <coughs> pictures of me, to send back to the NSA. So that's when I realized, I have to take a stand, man. I'm an American. I have rights. That's when I got the mirror. Bounce <laughs> <laughs> the satellite signals off my body. Back into space. <laughs> Annalyn was a little over the top. So in my next semester, I decided to take a more nuanced approach to filmmaking. <laughs> Influenced by the fragmented narrative of William Faulkner's The Sound and the Fury, I made GRB, which depicts the story of Charlotte, a successful actress. Presented in three fragmented installments, Charlotte's doppelganger crash lands into the cinematic universe at the beginning of the first film. While a sudden rise to fame leads the real Charlotte to the realization that her fame is eclipsing her identity, Imposter Charlotte makes it her primary objective to find out who she is. Cinema is a pastiche of music, poetry, photography, and theater. And the cohesive marriage of these elements demands an unwieldy and specific protocol. But the DIY ethic that permeates the air on set of a no-budget film romanticizes the process, making it look easy or intuitive. Through making Anna Land and GRB, it became evident that the gap between the inspiration that powered me through production and the end, end result on screen was too large for my liking. And I found the process of filmmaking quite limiting. Throughout this process, I learned a great deal about the history of cinema and film theory. But I became frustrated as they consistently failed to acknowledge the type of filmmaking that Craig said was possible. This prompted me to research the history of video art, the spirit of which is embodied by this quote from author and filmmaker, Gene Youngblood. Art explains, entertainment exploits. Entertainment gives us what we want. Art gives us what we don't know we want. To confront a work of art is to confront oneself, but aspects of oneself previously unrecognized. In catering to an audience's whim, the moving image's promise remains inside the confines of entertainment. But outside the flow of a cinema of consumption, the moving image can generate ideas or even promote discourse. I have a particular interest in a genre of filmmaking known as structuralist film, which boils the practice of filmmaking down into its most vital elements by centering its focus on the materials or the apparatus used in the process of filmmaking. This is a clip from a film called Matters of Bioluminescence by Robbie Land, in which he turns fireflies into filmmakers by catching them in jars that contain unexposed celluloid. 
The dominant flow of cinema persuades the viewer to see a work like this through a success fa failure binary. Exposing the materiality of cinema directly confronts the established cinematic flow because cinema presents itself as immaterial so convincingly. But outside this success failure binary, innovation is possible. This brings me to Bill Viola's 1973 piece entitled Information, which radically transformed the way I view my practice. In the studio one night, Viola accidentally fed the output of a video recorder back into its own input. When he pressed record, the tape inside cannibalized itself. This corrupted the video signal, resulting in the random display of patterns and static that will never play the same way twice. The signals on the tape are engaged in a constant process of transformation, making them performers. In making art out of error, Bill Viola makes the tape something more than just the copy of a performance. He makes the video the performer, proving that video as an art form exists beyond the scope of cinematic flow. This idea of transformation underscores my next piece, wave iteration, a single channel video which compiles the various stages of a video file's corruption. I saw Glitch as a timely way to examine these structuralist ideals, since it disrupts the visual flow of information, which cinema works so hard to maintain. This leads me to the state of my current practice. The internet has greatly transformed the way that we watch video. In the Brooklyn Rail last year, Judith Berry wrote that the internet's prevalence has initiated a collapse of medium specificity meaning since everything funnels through the computer now, the differences between mediums becomes less apparent. However, the underlying characteristics that typify a medium will always be in there, and this will reinvigorate mediums, both old and new. Zombie media reinvigorates older media by subverting the intended purpose of obsolete devices to comment on environmental issues of e-waste and to explore the undiscovered potentials of obsolete technology. Within this construct, not only is it possible to illustrate the limitations of cinematic flow, it would also be possible to embody the limitations of cinematic viewing conventions. <coughs> and that is precisely what I explore in my newest project called Gaze Interface, comprised of three computer monitors, a microphone, VGA and VGA cables that I made myself. In the gallery, the ambient sounds will be visualized. As you walk around the space, socialize, or look at my piece, you'll be creating the video piece simply by being there. In the last two years, I've struggled to understand cinematic flow <coughs> and its capabilities. Through Analand and GRB, I sought to use cinema's force against itself, almost like jujitsu. But it remained apparent that even when using cinema as a form of critique, it still diminished the possibilities of the moving image. Bill Viola's information revealed the way as I crossed beyond the borders of cinematic language. In wave iteration, the digital video file is the performer, and in gaze interface, the viewer creates the piece. Disrupting flow has always been at the heart of my practice. I believe that examining these ruptures to flow are necessary. As Martha, Ru as Martha Russell once wrote, to break the hypnotic tranquility of silent ascent into the internal order of things. <coughs> For this reason, I encourage you to break free from passive viewership, to give equal weight to the faults and the fissures, 
to resist the urge to march silently into the internal order of things. Thank you. Anna, could you? <clears throat> Come on down. Could you talk a little bit about um, where you see the physical place of non-narrative cinema? Uh, 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 does it exist outside of a gallery, and uh, if so, where? Do you mean like a venue? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, there are underground. Uh, well, there's the underground cinema circuit, uh, micro cinemas, and you know there is pretty healthy uh, sort of a community there that um, seems pretty close and tightly within. Is that? Yeah, I just, I, I guess I wonder if it has a place outside of the art world. Um. Yeah, I think so. Um, I remember reading in one of, one of the uh, articles I was reading that uh, we kind of need avant-garde film, which is basically what I'm talking about because uh, it inspires narrative filmmakers who try to put these things covertly into their films. Like the, the, the slit scan scene in 2001 Space Odyssey, uh, that came from an, uh, an experimental film. And uh, there are plenty of other uh, instances of that. And in fact, uh, I'm, one, one of my friends is using a video piece of mine and they're no film. So it does happen. Well, I was just going to actually ask that. Could you imagine making a narrative film with the avant-garde aspect, you know, so that your characters are, like, you know, activating that, like, that last piece so that... Because I, I just think that your... My opinion is that I think your narrative work is really good, and it seems like it would be interesting to see how those two things might talk to each other. Sure. I'm always open to the possibility of exploring that. I mean, uh, Something uh, that my mentor said to me, because uh, there's so much that I want to do at any given moment, and <laughs> and uh, my my mentor this semester said something pretty uh, amazing to me. She just uh, said, "Anna, you have to find your darling and kill all the other babies." <laughs> yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, so I feel all the Can you talk a little bit about, or can you just elaborate? Because I know in uh, traditional photography, it's a lot different on how you approach your films, like videos, uh, how, how you get the viewer to basically feel what you want them to feel, like the different lens types and things like that. Okay, uh, so you're asking about uh, cinematography, it sounds yeah. like. Well, it's really interesting because if you want a viewer to sympathize with a character, what you want to do is get in close and have them have, have their eye line pretty close to the lens but not looking directly into the lens. Uh, typically speaking, that will help viewers empathize with your character more. Uh, however, uh, the, the wider out you are, the, uh, I suppose, I don't want to say documentary, but the more uh, sort of objective, I think it is. Jesse? Hi. Um, <laughs> it's following the same kind of inquiry that um, Oliver and Deborah uh, started here. And, and it's really about accessibility to both the medium and your concepts. And Oliver asked, if there's a place for this outside of art, and my, my follow-up question would be, uh, outside of the art world, my, my follow-up question would be, is, is there a division in the art world, or any kind of, let's just say, is there a division between <coughs> people who can access your work in particular, let's say the genre as a whole, do you see there being a narrower audience for it? Um, do you feel you need to bridge the gap in any way? Um, and 
Well, that's enough, I guess. <laughs> Does that make sense? It's yeah. a loaded question, yeah. <laughs> of course. Yeah. Um, your question makes me think of of an experimental well, structuralist filmmaker I know named Jennifer West, who um, what she likes to do is um, all the processes that she puts her film through, that's the title of the film. So it's very accessible in that way. Like, uh, like I think one of her pieces is titled, you know, Film I Kept in the Fridge for 10 Years. You know, and it just, you know, and she just, you know, rejects that. And that's, that's one way of, I guess, becoming more accessible. Although I've read research, or not research, I've read articles where people call her out on that. And, you know, that's pretty interesting. Although, on the other hand, I think that, I, I mean, I was thinking about what Oliver asked. Um, I've kind of made the argument before that music videos can act as a gateway to experimental film. Sure. Mm -hmm. But in experimental film is the gateway. Yeah, to, yeah usually it's, to, I mean, if you look at Beyonce's that's uh, very uh, true. video video, it's certainly the other way around. By the way, just to be clear, I wasn't so much interested in whether things could exist outside the art world. I was more interested in what different kinds of venues, the internet, galleries, uh, you know, in some kind of uh, <coughs> online environment. You know, just, just, you know, the art world, I, I don't even know what that means anymore. I'm just curious yeah. who the audience is and where it physically yeah. is seen and experienced because it's, because it's time-based and it requires yeah. people to spend time with it. That's such a hard thing to provide a concrete answer to, I think, uh, because of the you know collapse of medium specificity that kind of opens a can of worms. And of course, uh, the way that we watch things is changing. Changing like um, you know we watch things on our phones and everything. Not everything, but things are becoming less tangible. And I think that um, well, I'm, I'm not going to go out, out on a limb and say this is what I think, but. I think it. Um, I think it's really interesting. <laughs> I'm not going to say what I. Um, I was thinking of. You made me think of a piece by a, a GIF artist named Warren Mills, um, and it was projected in Times Square in March. Right. And I thought that was really interesting because it's a GIF. It's on the internet, but here it is in Times Square, right. projected on all this stuff. And it made me think of that. Um, I'm interested in, in following up in your response to Oliver's question, and um, particularly in your new work and the ways that you are really sort of like hand manipulating things and wanting things to be directly responsive to your sound or some kind of tangibility factor. I'm wondering if, if there is a connection between some what you were saying about. Um, things becoming less and less tangible or, or something else that, um, that, that you yeah. inspires you know. It probably is. <laughs> and a piece that I know in, in and um, I was in a show in Atlanta in April and somebody wrote up about it and I was using a lot of old tech and he said I was overly nostalgic about what I was doing and that I was fetishizing the, you know this old this old tech. And that didn't seem right to me because I was just trying to make it accurate to the to you know a period of time that was you know in the 80s or 90s, and that was just more of a you know set deck kind of thing. But um, going back to that Martha Rossler quote, you know, about you know resistance, <coughs> you know, the silent ascent to the internal order of things, uh, that comes from an article where she is talking about um, Hito Stardle's poor image and poor imagery and how all this obsolete stuff is coming back. You know, because things are becoming so abstract, perhaps we need to hold on to something tangible to make sense of it. Thank you. Thank you very much.